What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. As always, it's your boy, Nicholas. Today, we're doing the 10-team PPR mock draft from the fifth spot because that is where I'll be drafting from in my big money league. So I want to start, you know, getting down in the trenches, seeing what kind of stuff I'm going to be working with. And this is on Fantasy Football Calculator. Wow, we just had Julio go over David Johnson. There are a couple computers in this room. I, I've tried for like 20 minutes to get a room full of actual players, but it looks like there's going to be three computers. So I'm drafting from the fifth spot. This is absurd that David Johnson is going farther than the third already. This is the most absurd mock draft I've already seen. The fifth spot right now turned into a tricky spot. I'm going to go with Odell right now. Here's, here's what's going on in my head. To me, the one and two picks are by far the best place in the draft that you could be in a fantasy football draft this year because you're getting either Le'Veon Bell or David Johnson. In my home league, I'm actually trying to move up to the second spot. I'm trying to trade my fifth spot for the second. And I have four keepers that I could choose from for next year. It's Drew Brees, Danny Woodhead, Pierre Garcon, and D. Jax. And I, you know, I'd lose like anywhere from like a ninth to a 14th round keeping those guys. So I'm trying to just, I'm, I'm in talks with the I think it's the first overall pick to move up to his spot. And I said, you could take any of those players. Or I said, you could take Garcon, Woodhead, or Deshaun Jackson for free. And all you have to do is switch spots with me. So we'll see if he bites on that. Because the fifth spot right now, when I f originally got the fifth spot, I was super excited, right? Because you're getting one of those top tier players. You're either getting one of the two top running backs or you're getting one of the top three wide receivers. Julio, Antonio Brown, Odell Beckham. And to me, all those guys are in a completely a complete tier of their own. Now, with this Odell Beckham ankle injury, it kind of throws a wrench into my plan, depending on how severe the injury is. Because now, if it goes Bell, Johnson, Brown, Julio, and I'm stuck at five and Beckham's injured, it's going to be tricky. I'm most likely still going to stay with Odell Beckham, as long as it's not like a crazy, crazy injury. But to me, it's just more so because I think the six spot, anywhere from the six spot on, is kind of a dead zone. Because from Mike Evans all the way to like pick 14, where it's six all the way to 14, I don't see a big value jump. I don't see a change. in it. There's no one that I'm like, this guy is way ahead. And I know LaShawn McCoy is like, it's to me, it's ridiculous that LaShawn McCoy is, a lot of people are asking, is it crazy if I go with him at the four or five hole? I think that's, I think that's crazy. I do think he's probably, the, I actually have Devonta Freeman ranked ahead of McCoy at running back. The, the train needs to, to slow down on McCoy just a little bit. I can't take him in the top five. I'm up anyways right now. So Melvin fell to me at 15, which would be fantastic if that happened in a real draft. This is PPR, but he's going to get a ton of touches. So I'm going to go Melvin here. And I've talked about it. I think best strategy this year is you always play by value and depending on what happens in the draft. But I want to come out of the first three rounds with a minimum one running back, hopefully two, because the, the middle tier wide receivers are so much stronger than running back. So I'm super happy with Melvin at 15. The only thing that sucks for me in my draft is I already know Michael Thomas is being kept by someone and I already know Jordan Howard is being kept by someone. One. So guys that you would normally get are probably being taken two picks ahead because those guys won't be getting picked in the first two rounds. Isaiah Crowell is also being kept. So a, a few good players in the, in the top couple rounds are being kept, which is it's the same every year for my league. But that just throws another little wrench in here. But at the five spot, if I can start off with Odell and Melvin, I'd be ecstatic. And this is exactly what I mean. Like I've seen plenty of mock drafts where Melvin Gordon goes where LaShawn McCoy goes at the eight spot. So if you're getting a pick after pick five, it's really all preference and who you think is going to be the best play there. So within the top five, it's pretty easy. But with Odell injury, I'm a little nervous. And then picking at 25, who are we looking at right now? Quarterback's way too early in a full PPR league. I would have looked at Cooper there. I'm not high on any of these running backs at all. Third round is just way too early for McCaffrey, way too early for Cook for me. I do really like Cook and I do really like Ty Montgomery, but I don't I just think they're way too risky right now. If Doug Baldwin falls to me right here, I'd be probably ecstatic about that. Or T. Y. Hilton. Okay, so I have my pick of these guys. Now T. Y. Hilton for me has moved down a tier over the summer. And I've kind of been talking about Andrew Luck the whole summer. And I was like one of the first people that kind of said like, we need to be way more worried about Andrew Luck than we are. He's being considered an elite quarterback, like, all the time. And I get it because he was an elite prospect. But he had that year in 2014, 40, 40 touchdowns, like 4,700 passing yards. But he cannot stay on the field. Like, their offensive line is just so bad. He's led the league in quarterback knockdowns every single year. And in the in the years that he, that he hasn't led the league in it, He's been on pace to lead the league, and just and the only reason he didn't was because he, he missed games because he's been knocked down so often. He's not guaranteed to play in week one or even week two uh, of this season so far. So you have to tremendously knock down everyone on the on the Colts receiving court if Luck misses any time, and that includes T.Y. Hilton. So 
Previously, T.Y. Hilton was in a tier above the Doug Baldwin's, Amari Cooper's, and Des Bryant for me. But now he's behind all those guys. And I would still, at, at this point, I would still definitely take him in front of some of the guys I see going off here for Brandon Cooks, DeAndre Hopkins, Terrell Pryor for sure. But it, it just, you you have to knock him down slightly, just assuming that luck misses games. Lamar Miller's really being knocked down here, huh, too. I, I really like that if I can get Miller in the fourth round. I guess it's, it's because Deonta Foreman made a couple big plays, but I'm not looking at that. You know, Bill O'Brien came out the like the day after the game and said he's a long way off he's still got a ton of a ton of time to go it's not a good pass catcher i'm not worried about foreman taking lamar miller's role at all i think miller's a guaranteed 240 touches this year if not way more so if he drops there i'm fine i'm perfectly fine taking travis kelsey here too i've had plenty of mock drafts where i took travis kelsey in the third round when if, if i'm in the later rounds like seven or eight pick like over here and it's also a dead zone like instead of taking a guy like dalvin cook or Terrell Pryor, i'd be much happier taking a travis kelsey because i think he's safe play with tight end one upside with probably tight end three floor see what he did last year in the games without macklin he had three of his 400 yard receiving games were without macklin and now he's taking over that you know that leader role in the, the pass captain group in kc so i think he's safe so right now i'm targeting you know it, lamar miller or travis kelsey so hopefully they're not hopefully they're not picking the next two guys. That would be that would be heart wrenching. All right, Tyree Kill, cool. So I'm gonna get one of the guys that I want. If it didn't happen, I would probably be looking at oh, there goes Lamar. So I'll go Kelsey here for show. I'd probably be looking at Demarius Thomas, Larry Fitzgerald, or Michael Crabtree. Those two just went off the board. I think those three are all very likely to finish around the same exact statistics. It's super hard to argue that one is ahead of the other or, or you know, vice versa or whatever. Almost a lock to keep finishing around a thousand yards, if not more. And then their touchdowns will vary anywhere probably from like five up to eight, nine. I would say fits the most there. But then I think they're all great picks in the fourth round. A lot of people are taking D. Thomas in the third round, which I'm probably not co-signing on because he's been great, right? I, obviously, the argument is 1,000-yard receiving years over the last four or five years, but there's not a lot of upside there. He doesn't score a lot of touchdowns anymore now that they're not that like dominant offense with Peyton Manning. He doesn't get those screen plays that he was so good at. He's not the deep threat with, that, with Sanders there. And on the, on the points per game basis, he's usually finishing between wide receiver 18 and 20, and that's not where I want to draft my... That's not what I want to use my third round pick on. I use it on Doug Baldwin, and the reason I love Baldwin is because him and Wilson just have such an incredible connection. We saw it in the preseason game already. He's been a top 10 fantasy wide receiver each of the last two seasons. Don't think that stops now. I think Russell Wilson's in for a big, big bounce back here. All right, so fifth round. Have my eye on either Joe Mixon or Larry Fitzgerald. And this is the thing about tight ends too. Like I could have waited on Travis Kelsey and still gotten Greg Olson here and then had one of those, another wide receiver, Michael Crabtree or Demarius Thomas to pair with these three. I love Mixon's upside, but I'm going to go with Fitz. I think in every single mock draft I've done for you guys this, this summer, I've probably had Fitz as my fifth round pick. So, so if Fitz busts out this year, busts in a bad way, like has a terrible year, you guys are going to be like, Nick, you are the worst. I probably own him on 100% of the teams I've mocked. But I was between him and Joe Mixon. Joe Mixon has just incredible upside. I've seen him go as early as a third round in mocks, which is definitely too early for me because we've seen Jeremy Hill get plenty of work this preseason. But Mixon's mixing in with the first team a ton during their games, especially in practice too. In my opinion, the way fantasy works is like opportunity is a short-term thing. Talent is a long-term thing, right? Talent leads to opportunity. And that's the case for Mixon. While I don't necessarily think Mixon will be the lead back for the first few games, I think eventually, right, they keep giving him these first team snaps. They'll put him and Hill on the field, not together, but one at a time, right? And Mixon's just going to clearly look a lot better. He's going to run better. He's going to be way more effective. And eventually that will turn into him taking over that backfield. So now I have three wides, running back, a tight end. And at this point in my big league, like I said, I play two flexes, two running backs, two wide receivers, a quarterback, and a tight end. So I could still draft another wide receiver and start him in my flex spot. Now, I do really like Bilal Powell as a PPR play. My thing is, I forget what statistic, who wrote this statistic. I think it was Mike Taglieri of NFL.com. He said, if you are on a bottom eight scoring team in the NFL, you have a 7% chance of being an RB1 in fantasy. So you almost have no chance. That that goes for guys like Todd Gurley, Leonard Fournette, and Bilal Powell. It's super, super hard to be an RB1 in on a bad offense because your scoring opportunities just aren't there. So right now, I'm probably looking at a Stefan Diggs to fill my last flex spot here. I've been rising on Diggs, and oh, what the f- they pick, ah, I got Diggs in there too late, and they took Mike Gillisley for me. That is the opposite of who I want in a PPR play. Well, I might as well speak on him, right? So 
we got Mike Gillisley, and now we have Rex Burkhead just falling out right now. Um, Gillisley is the last PPR play I want on that team, basically. You can get Burkhead for eight rounds cheaper than you can get Gillisley right now. Been out all preseason, hasn't got any real time yet in the games. I'm not saying that he's the terrible pick in round six, seven. At the touchdown opportunities, of course, they are in this high powered offense, but I, that's not who I want as my RB2 in a PPR league. So we'll pretend that, that I didn't pick Gillisley there because I did not. And luckily for me, nope, not luckily for me, Stefan Diggs was picked. I still like Jameson Crowder a lot. I actually love Emmanuel Sanders as well this year. So had I had taken Stefan Diggs there, I would probably be taking Abdullah here. So I'm going to go with Abdullah. I mean, I get the argument. Abdullah is only going to be running within the 20s. Theoretic is their clear pass catching back. Zach Zenner is their goal line back. One, I would say this. What we've seen from the preseason is Abdullah is getting all the work with the first team. They put him in for like three runs, get him out. That's what you do with your starting running back, a guy who you really want to protect and you don't want to see a lot of time in the preseason. That's exactly what they're doing with Amir Abdullah. You also see in the snaps that he's in during the preseason, getting targets, a ton of receiving work. And for people that think Theo Riddick is the only guy that can catch the ball out of the backfield, they're they're stupid because that's not that's not the case. Amir Abdul is a really, really good athlete, really good pass catcher. So that team overall usually gives the running backs between 120 and 130 targets. So even if Theo Riddick gets the large majority of them, there's plenty of work for Amir Abdullah. And I think his rushing upside could easily be 900 to 1,000 yards, add in 300 yards receiving, and you've got a, a top 12 back there. Now, the, the touchdown and the goal line work is where it's up for grabs. I understand that Zach Zenner has gotten some of the goal line work in practice. I'm not looking at quarterback yet, even though there was a little run there. Still plenty of good ones on the board. I'm going to go with Emmanuel Sanders here. I actually think Emmanuel Sanders might finish as the wide receiver one in Denver this year. I really like him and Simeon's connection. I think it's very, very underrated. I think Simeon's kind of underrated as a quarterback as well. Sixth or seventh in the league in average depth of target last year. People assume that he's just like a game manager. He doesn't really do much, but no, that's not the case. He takes a lot of deep balls, a lot of deep shots down the field. And uh, him and Sanders had a good connection. And then that offensive line went out. They made some changes, draft picks for agency. So he'll have much more time in the pocket to, you know, look downfield. And I think that's also an upgrade for him. But back to Abdullah, I don't, I'm not completely sold on the fact that Zach Sanders is just their end-all, be-all goal line back. Amir Abdullah can score the ball. Ninth round, they have Mariota over Luck. Now, this is where I'm very much down on Luck. But as a ninth round pick, when you only have guys like these on the board, you have a lot of backup running backs, I am perfectly okay taking him here and then if you need to which i probably will i'll pair him with with another quarterback later in the draft but mirabdul like i said i'm not sold on him being like the end-all be-all not getting any goal line touches you know his size he, very much similar in size to devonta freeman and there's other backs that he's similar in size to that have seen plenty of success on the goal line so you can't just say he's small he can't do it so that's not the case. I'm just a believer in Amir Abdul's talent. I think this is the year that he finally gets a chance to show it off. And this is the best offensive line they've had in years with Abdullah there. So I think this is like a black and white area for a lot of people. People are either completely off Abdullah or completely on. And I am definitely in the latter. So we got a quarterback. We got our tight end. Four wide receivers. Or I would have five wide receivers, two running backs. So I'm probably going to need to target running backs if I pretended I had Stefan Diggs there in the sixth round. So let's check out some RBs. I've been taking a ton of Thomas Rawls, so I'm probably going to stick with that. Not the best PPR play, but the rest of the guys on the board, I'm just not a huge fan of. Terrence West is good. I like him as their starter. I think he'll do fine. Not a great PPR play with Danny Woodhead there, of course. Duke Johnson, I don't think I'll ever buy into his hype. Might have a big year, but they also say every single offseason that he has the potential to be a three down back and they're moving him around and he's going to get this many catches, blah, 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 blah. I'm just I'm just not sold on Duke. I don't know. I hate Lacey. I actually would definitely debate Jack Quizzer Rogers here. I'm probably Probably going Rawls here in a season long league because I think you know he has that upside that league winning potential if he could stay healthy, which is of course a big concern. But you're getting him in the 10th round, so everyone's just auto picking now, so I don't even have time to talk about these damn picks. So I'll go quiz here. The thing I like about quiz is fantasy football, right? Your draft is not the end all be all. Your, dra your draft is probably like 40% of you winning your league, the rest is waiver wire pickup. So by the time quiz is not the starter there anymore week four you'll have your eye on some running backs that could potentially make a swing and that's something to keep an eye on with the joe mixons or whatever like he could be a trade target right like he doesn't get a lot of play in maybe the first couple of weeks and you feel like joe mixon might eventually take over the backfield that's someone you could you could target for me that's why i don't use strength of schedule as such a big factor in guys that i pick All right, i got a lot of depth of skill position so i'm just going to go ahead and back up andrew luck with Dak. actually i didn't look at the schedules for the first couple weeks so if andrew luck is out if you're someone taking andrew luck right and you think he's going to be out the first couple weeks you definitely want to see whatever quarterback you're picking as qb2 
We want to look at their first couple weeks matchups. Probably not going to get to it before my pick is up. But I know that Dak goes against that tough Giants defense the first week. So while I do like Dak better than Andy Dalton probably overall, I'm going to take Dalton right now. And I have no idea who Dalton's actually. What the fuck? All right. Well, they didn't. The, the timer ran out again. But pretend I have Dalton there. So you, you'd want to look at weeks one, maybe even week two schedule to kind of determine that. So Cincinnati goes against Baltimore. That, Baltimore's a pretty good defense, but they're they're definitely not someone you're just like sitting a quarterback on because of that. And they're home. So that's even better. Okay. So they took Dalton anyways with my next pick. So I guess that's not the worst thing. And then week two, who does Dalton have? They're home, but they're against Texans who are tough tough team on Thursday night. That's tough because you don't know if Andy, they probably won't announce if Luck will be ready for week two midway through the week. That's a tough one for Dalton, but a good, good week one matchup, I would say. I don't know why they keep auto picking for me. I'm not even an auto pick. I didn't miss any of my, my draft picks. All right. So I guess I'll just talk out the rest of this draft because they're just picking guys for me now. Anyways, when I get to like later here, like I said, if you're getting Luck, pair him with Dalton, in the later rounds, I would be looking at literally all my guys on like my sleeper list for wide receivers right here. So there's plenty of depth at wide receiver. Even a Tyler Lockett, I think, is going severely undervalued this year. So that draft went really quick because there's a lot of auto picking in these last couple rounds. But this is where the money is made. From picks like 10 to 13, you can get a lot of players with some big upside. Jack Doyle. I love my boy Marlon Mack. Now, a lot of you guys are saying, I would say one thing. First of all, if, if you're emailing me or hitting me on Twitter or leaving comments down below with your team, First of all, I don't. Sometimes you guys just list your teams. I don't know if you're asking me to rank it or rate it or what you're doing. But if you do that, please put the number of teams in your league. If you're in a 10 team league, 12 team league, put that. Also put your scoring. If it's standard, half point PPR, PPR. Because when you put that, I don't. It, uh, ranking a team in an 8 team league that's PPR is way different than ranking a 12 team league in a standard. So make sure you do that. And I have no problem. You know, do that as much as you want. I, I'm. Have, the best part about doing this YouTube stuff is being able to engage with you. I want to be interactive, but make sure, you know, the more specific you can get with a question, the better it is for me to answer it. So this is what my team kind of ended up looking like. Very strong at wide receiver. I see that the running backs are not my strong suit probably. But what I was saying with quiz, by week four, you probably have guys that you can pick up on the waiver wire. That's why I don't look at strength of schedule too much because, you know, how teams change so much from weeks like one to six. If you're drafting a player because his overall strength of schedule on the year is like number five or something in the league, I think that's just stupid. It's like someone tweeted out, it's like trying to hit the moon with a laser pointer. It's just like, it's ineffective. It's just, it's just a number that people throw out just to be like, yeah, I looked at the statistics and this and that. And it's just a stupid way of clarifying yourself. Unless you have maybe like five or six or seven matchups against elite, elite defenses, like someone in the Denver division. I've heard a lot of talk about Dez's tough matchups. He has Norman, he has, you know, the Giants cornerback, all that kind of stuff. I don't weigh that that much. It might be a tiebreaker, but I'm not staying off guys based on that. And that goes back to quiz. After three weeks, you'll get, you'll have an idea of guys to pick up. So with me, the idea with him and the same thing with like Darren McFadden, six weeks of an RB1 or RB2, that's nice because by that time in the season, your team is going to be a drastically different than it was when you started, most likely, unless you're really lucky with injuries or your draft was just that dynamite. But that's it. If you enjoyed the video, please just scroll down a little bit, give it that thumbs up because that's how other people find me. The more engagement, comments, and likes I have on the videos, that's like how I get more subscribers because people get me on the sidebar of, of their you know suggested videos from YouTube. So please do that. Leave a comment. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be coming at you with videos all summer and I will see y'all later.